All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us once again on Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC show. So we're hanging out with our good friends over at New Calgon, Dave Ferrone and Doug Gildhaus. How are you guys doing? Good. Hey, Clifton. Well, we really appreciate you joining us. You know, there are so, there's a lot of things for us to talk about in the industry, a lot of things that are evolving and a lot of companies looking at how can we contribute even more than we already have. And New Calgon is a prime example, right? If we think about New Calgon, what are most people familiar with with New Calgon? Chemicals, right? A lot, of, a, lot of great, a lot of great chemicals. It wasn't until here just a few months ago, and I'm going through looking at different um, different assets for the industry and different ways to help people be prepared for new refrigerants and new technologies. And I found the EcoPure line from New Calgon and I went, wait a what? <laughs> uh, R290 and R600 with our friends at New Calgon. I need to know more about this. So I reached out to Dave and here we are today. So Dave, tell us a little bit about how New Calgon got into the flammable refrigerant sector. Well, yeah, thanks Clifton. This is, uh, it's, it's a little bit outside of our normal wheelhouse. Yeah. You know, we have a complete line of chemicals, um, but this is outside of what we normally do. And, you know, we had some wholesalers and customers who are, you know, wholesalers who are our primary customer here a couple of years ago, sitting, meeting with our executives. And one of them brought up the challenges they were having with sourcing R290. Oh, so yeah, absolutely. That led uh, us and our new product development team, led by Doug, to go ahead and start researching and finding out, you know, how to best support the industry. So work through our vendor channels, our vendor partners to develop the EcoPure line. Uh, we've got the two package gases, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, but also the two different tools, which are great options for oh, technicians yeah. to use. You know, whether they're, you know, experienced or they're a seasoned veteran or, you know, not not very seasoned veteran. Um, you know, we've got got a great option for each each tech. Absolutely. And also, while everyone is starting to join in, please let us know where you're chiming in from. I'm hanging out here in Brownsburg, Indiana, just outside of Indianapolis. Dave, where are you at? We're here in St. Louis, uh, Missouri at our headquarters. Awesome. Fantastic. So yeah, let us know where you're chiming in from. We see we got Daniel out there coming in from Tennessee. And another thing that I want to point out before we dive too deep into our presentations today, we are running a really, really cool promo right now. So we are doing a sponsorship with True Tech Tools for the most influential instructor, which you guys would absolutely qualify for this. So everyone at New Calgon, uh, start doing some pinging yeah. for Dave and Doug on this. So what we're doing is at the National HVACR Education Conference, we are doing a promotion for a uh, for we're going to be having shirts that will have all of our top 25 of the candidates that are registered as the most influential educator or trainers of the year. And we're going to do this. We're going to run it for about 30 days or so. And so we want everyone to make sure to go there and and register for who has helped make a big influence in your journey in this HVACR industry. So, all right, selfless plug right there. Let's get back to education. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Well, let's, yeah, let's dive into hydrocarbons because they are a absolute um, must for HVAC and refrigeration technicians to understand. If you're not currently working on systems that have highly flammable refrigerants, I would be prepared for that because even the residential guys go, hey, uh, really in residential? And I go, well, there are a lot of things you may not be aware of. Like if you follow the SNAP policy, the EPA significant new alternatives program, we have the approval for using things like R290, even in air conditioning systems. So if we look at real quick, I just want to share this one, uh, just for the naysayers that say, ah, oh, we're not going to see uh, we're not going to see R290 in residential. Boom, right there. Residential and light commercial heat pumps approved in 2015 for use in self-contained room air conditioning systems with detailed conditions. So we don't have them. I haven't seen any myself yet here in the United States. We've seen them abroad, but they were actually approved in 2019. Now, commercial refrigeration, they're everywhere. We had Lear telling us that they're converting all their ice chest over to 290. Manitowoc moving their ice machines into R290. Residential, we've seen R290 and 600 for a decade, if we didn't already know that. So we are moving into some very new refrigerants. So, all right, I'm pretty excited to learn more about this and the resources. So that's enough of me yakking. Let's let's uh, <laughs> get some time with you guys. <laughs> so, you know, I think, Many people are familiar with us and New Calgon mm -hmm. and what we do, but you know we like to view ourselves as the value-added company. We've got 
uh, factory direct sales force. We've got uh, we provide uh, wholesaler training to road shows every year. We have mm-hmm. trainings at our St. Louis uh, uh, St. Louis facility here, three typically per year. Uh, we've got a great online resource with uh, New Calgon mm-hmm. University. Um, and, you know, we, we feel like we have the most complete uh, specialty chemical product line. So, yeah, that new, con- new Calgon University, great source of getting continuing education credits, uh, really great uh, tool for people to learn all about the different products we offer. Um, and like I said, this is a little bit outside of our wheelhouse and what we normally do, but we are excited about it. Uh, we think it's a great way for us to support the industry as it moves into something that is is new That's to new. many people. So yeah. there, there's a um, lot of scared people out there going, boy, this is uh, this is really scary. This is really challenging. And we go, well, everything yeah. is scary and challenging until we get educated about it. And then it just becomes standard. You know, yeah, we've been through absolutely. these transitions before. It's not really new. It's just we just got to be prepared. Yeah. So, you know, really, I think when we always talk about this, we like to start with where we've been mm. and and what, uh, you know, why we're going through this period. So Doug will t- take us through a little bit of that. Sure. Uh, I find it interesting uh, to talk about where we've been while we're looking towards the future. Yep. And what's interesting about hydrocarbons, R290, R600, they're not exactly new. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been around for 100 years or more. So right. if you ter- look at the turn of the century, we were using hydrocarbons. And the reason for that is they were simple molecules at the time. Yep. And so we're kind of going back. Frankly, we're making a full circle. And so I, I find that intriguing, really. Um, if you look back in the 30s, you know, R12 came along and R502 thereafter, R22. And early 90s, we got into HSCs, been doing those, uh, been selling, I would say, just HSCs for 30 years. Uh, and we're moving away from that. There's obviously a lot of industry press going to new refrigerants. And it's going to be uh, by committee. There's not a single refrigerant that's going to do it. That's exactly uh, right. For smaller systems, R2, hydrocarbons, R290, R600, uh, have a lot of play for lots of reasons that Dave will get into. You get into a little bit bigger systems, you're hearing a lot about the A2L refrigerants. Absolutely. Tons your, of them. Tons of it. And there, and we'll talk about here on the next slide or two. And then cool. larger CO2 and mm-hmm. then ammonia. Again, ammonia's not been new always been there in that regard so it's our naturals it's natural so it's the uh, you know it's by committee so it's not a single refrigerant but it's going to be by committee uh so i find that intriguing you know you look at you know all the press with the phase down that things are really going to hit the fan starting next year with you know another 30 percent reduction off 2015 baseline so uh each country has its own you know a trajectory on how to do that but hs HSCs will be uh, a little more scarce than they were, you know, this year because of the planned phase down. So absolutely. with that said, R290, R600, where they can play, will continue to grow. And so that's the reason for the discussion today. Um, you know, switching gears, and we're not going to go through this chart. What I like showing here is kind of the buckets of thought. And so you look at refrigerants that we're leaving, we're, well, we're not. We're phasing down the HSCs, the R134A, 404A, 410A. We're starting a plan phase out. And then you'll listen to the industry. There's a lot of what we would call transitional refrigerants. Yes. R44A uh, and in, in R449 for refrigeration. And even though it's new, it's kind of a transitional refrigerant. R32, Daikin is going to be using that. R54B, you know, carrier and others are looking at that as an A2L refrigerant for air conditioning. So in, they categorize that by GWP. And so, uh, and so, you know, they're 600, 700, 500, you know, GWP values. And so they're considered transitional. Now we can use the word transitional. It might be transitional for a long time. Yeah, uh, exactly. But, so it's or transitional, could be short. but long window <laughs> yeah. uh, for, for air conditioning. Uh, but you look at refrigeration, uh, you get into, and really the topic of discussion today is R290, R600. They have virtually zero GWP, yeah, three, almost nothing and very low yeah. down there. So these are, from an eco profile, they're very good. And from a performance prof- uh, profile. Yeah, they're, they're good refrigerants. Great refrigerants. So yeah. uh, there's a lot of plus side to that. So it's p- uh, pockets of thought of, you know, there's where we are. Some transitionals could be long and where they want to go. It's all based on a GWP 150 to 300 being max, being more of a long-term play there. 
Um, so anyway, that's why I wanted to show that slide. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you hear a lot of terms out there, certainly in recent years, A1, A2L, A3. ASHRAE has safety classifications for restrictions on how they're listed. So the 134A, 410A, 404A, you know, those are considered A1 refrigerants. So they are a low toxicity, uh, no flame propagation. They don't provide any, any, any flame, no flame propagation. Um, you will hear a lot about the A2Ls. It's a low flammability. And so there's a lot that will come you know, out of that you know, in, in recent, you know, more you know, in, in coming years. With the R290, R600A, we're talking about, we call it A3. So it has a low toxicity, but it has a higher flammability. Mm -hmm. And so and we'll get into that here a little bit. So that's the thing to be aware of. And yep. it's all can be tempered with education. Just yep. understand what we're dealing with. Oh, absolutely. And we'll do a shout out to everyone that is joining us. Cody, thank you. Alberto, uh, Okarike, thank you so much for everyone hopping in here and letting us know where you're at. Sure, Afghan, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, hop in here. Mike, uh, Paul, uh, let's keep the conversations going. Really, we're here for you all. It's not like we're here just proclaiming uh, you know, the new news, we're here to share it with you. <laughs> we're here to bring you into our community so that we all can get through this together. And so we can embrace this change and we can, you see what we're doing, don't you, everyone? We're bringing in the top industry educators and instructors, whatever the topic is, we go out and we find the best people for it and we bring them to you so we can have this community. So we can all talk about these things positively and professionally. Ryan, thank you so much for hopping in here, Grand Rapids. So yeah, sorry guys. I just want to make sure that no, everyone knows right. how inclusive and how much we enjoy having everyone joining in from all over the world today, which is even better. That's great. That's yeah. Great. Um, the next slide really is just a continuation of what we just talked about. So really the refrigerant uh, segment is evolving, right? It's It continues to change as we yeah. go. So You'll see a lot of news with the HFC, HFO blends that are out there. Mm -hmm. And for refrigeration systems, you know, long term wise, there you're looking at GWPs of 150 to 300, depending on the size of the equipment and exactly. our application. So those are long term values. Those are targets we're wanting to hit. So if you look from a long term perspective, planned mainstays, ones that are going to be here yeah. uh, long term the systems ammonia, that are here for a little while. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ammonia, industrial process, yep. cooling, large applications, industrial, uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, you know, refrigeration, trans subcritical CO2 applications. We're talking R290, 600 for 600A for smaller systems. Uh, and there's some ones down the road, HFC, HFO blends that have low GWP for supermarket refrigeration uh, we'll look at as well. So th those are all, then there's some automotive applications. So what's interesting with air conditioning, before we get back into refrigeration, with R32, R404B, uh, those have higher than 300 GWP. So technically they're a transition. I'm not sure you know what that really means. It's right. a long-term transition, but yeah, they have exactly. a higher 500 to 700 GWP right. in that regard. So. And there's going to be some areas that are already saying they're not even going to allow that. You know, some states, some jurisdictions, yep, yep. you know, yep. we've got the technology transition rule coming through with the EPA. You know, all of these things could be expedited. And so when we send out these reports and then we send out these newsletters and we put out these blogs and posts and people go, oh, well, yeah, yeah, I see where we're talking about doing that over the, you know, the, the next 13 years. And we go, well, you know, that is like one of the pieces of legislation. There mm -hmm. are multiple layers in there, to, and especially depending on where you live. So some of this may come much, much faster than you're anticipating. Because some people mm -hmm. go, well, we'll, yeah, we'll see this in the next year or the next five years. And I'll go, uh, when's the last time you actually went to Costco or Walmart and looked at a window air conditioner? They're all already R32. When's the last time you looked at a pop cooler? Thank you. I noticed one while ago, Kimi. I think it was Matt was saying all the cases at Kroger are 290. You know, back yep. when I was working, when I was a mobile engineer back at Meyer, so I was doing, you know, new store startups and commissionings and working on older grocery stores. And a lot of our checkout lanes 10, almost 10 years ago, were converting over to true R290 coolers. So yep. it's not like they're new. I mean, for the last 10 years, you've been walking by R290 coolers and probably didn't even know it because they hadn't broke yet. But, you yep. know, yep. Yep. We're, we're getting a decade in. So now we have to be flexible enough to be able to work on this stuff. Yep. yep. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that leads us to really the question of, you know, about what about 
hydrocarbons, right? You know, yeah. and, and where are we going with the new refrigerants that Doug talked about? Those A3, R290, R600A, you know, we've got propane or isobutane. And and what about them as refrigerants? So uh, what, you know, what you think about when you think about a hydrocarbon as a refrigerant, the important thing to consider is the efficiency. So they provide yes. great heat transfer, which is, you know, helps with the efficiency. So and that, that's specific when you compare them to the HFCs that they're replacing. So units that are more efficient, need less refrigerant, they use less energy to run. Uh, you know, th that's really the whole name of the game here. All this push for green energy, climate yeah. change legislation, all those things, driving towards greener uh, refrigerants, using less energy. And that's that's where all this is coming from. So you mentioned it already, true manufacturing, Lear. Mantwalk, you've got all these companies moving over. So R290, R600A, very commonly uh, used uh, as refrigerants by the OEMs out there in today's marketplace. So, uh, you know, as Doug mentioned, low environmental impact, low, D low GWP, zero ozone depleting potential. Uh, really, these are, these are good eco-friendly refrigerants that are out there in the marketplace now. Indeed. So, um, you know, but you got to consider what's different about them. As Doug mentioned, right. they're flammable. That's the thing. They're they're not toxic, but they are highly flammable. So they fall into that A3 category. Uh, you know, many of the procedures that a technician is going to use when working on a hydrocarbon system are very similar to the procedures they're working on other systems. It's it's that's the procedures and technical ability that they need to have is not that different. However, the types of tools they have are going to be different. Okay. All right. Very they're going to have different types of tools with them, uh, you know, that are specifically for hydrocarbons or designed for that type of refrigerant. So uh, that's something to keep in mind, the procedures and the skills they need, not really that, that different. The, the tools might be though, depending on what they're doing. Sure. So, um, so that's important to keep in mind. So in the current guidelines, uh, you know, newly produced units, uh, that are specifically designed for R290 or R600A uh, can contain 150 grams of refrigerant or less. So that's uh, 5.3 ounces or one third of a pound. That's that's the current limit um, that you have is 150 grams or less of these. Now, many systems hold significantly under that, but that's the yeah. maximum allowable charge. You know, this is going to be household refrigerators, freezers, uh, vending machines, retail food refrigerators, freezers, ice chests, ice makers. There's so many things out there. We hit on the, the pop station that you see at the checkout at Walgreens. That's a, if that, that's likely going to have R290 in it. The little freezer cases in the middle of the aisle at Aldi's, those might have, have a, you know, a, a small uh, R290 system in there. There's so many things, like you said, you walk by every day uh, you know, it's already in people's lives. They just don't know that they're encountering it. So I've been looking at different manufacturers of commercial refrigeration because that was my specialty. I worked on a lot of little junk over the years. And so I was very curious what the manufacturers were doing. And I have found multiple manufacturers that go all the way up to three door reach in freezers operating on R290. So they have a pretty significant amount of capacity because of the efficiency of the refrigerant. But yeah, three door reach in freezers, absolutely have the potential of having R290 in them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, like you said, I mean, it, it, it's, it's already out there and, and true manufacturing who's a St. Louis company that been in, you know, they've been doing it for years and, and pretty much everything they have is to R290. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, it, it's all over the place already. And it's just going to keep growing as, yes. as the legislation keeps expanding. Sure. So. A lot of people don't realize that we were talking about this before the show. You know, this year in the UK, one of the most popular um, residential systems were R290 powered mono block, basically water source heat pumps so that you could produce hot water, cold water off from a mono block outdoor unit running on R290. So we are going to see that moving into the United States and being voted on, but you have all the building code, you know, that's a long process, just like we're struggling with A2Ls right now. Uh, but we absolutely have the potential to see larger quantities of R290 going into uh, equipment in the future, depending on its location, its installation. Think about propane right now. How many pounds of, uh, well, that's not technically R290 because it's got sulfur dioxide, it's got, <laughs> it's got odorants in it, but how many pounds of 
propane do we have sitting, you know, a couple feet from our structure right now outside? Yeah. Typically yeah. 20 plus, right? Yeah. In propane, because RT90 is just a purified propane. So, yeah. you know, there will be a lot of the R290 moving into locations that you may not have been prepared for. Yeah. Well, and that, and that like we've, we talked about earlier and, and we've mentioned is, you know, we're, we're just scratching the surface you yes. know, as the laws change and as this, the push for green energy and, you know, climate uh, legislation, we're just scratching the surface. So, um, you know, where are we going though? That's important to consider. You know, yeah. they have, uh, UL has approved, uh, increasing the charge limits. So uh, depending on the types of equipment that it's going in. So it, what we're at now is the 150 grams or less. What we're eventually going to go to is a maximum of 300 to 500, depending on the type of appliance that we're, we're looking at. So you're going to have a maximum charge of 300 grams on closed appliances, like a walk-in or something like that, uh, up to 500 grams on a open appliance. Uh, so you know, we're going to see that that charge limit dramatically increase, which is going to open up more applications for different types of, of equipment to have this in it. So those changes are in process. We think, you know, here on the horizon, very near future, we're going to have um, start to see more of that design out there. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah. Um, but. Okay. So really, you know, how you mentioned that the propane tank you got outside your house or, or on the back deck, oh, right? How go. much is 300, 500 grams? That's where <laughs> we're going. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. You know, that, that propane tank is, is roughly 9,000 grams. Uh, you know, that little Coleman tank that I take camping with me on the weekends, mm -hmm. that's going to be 500 grams. That's really not that much. Um, that's not that much propane, right? It's really a very, very small amount of liquid uh, in that charge there. And then really, even you drop down further, what kind of into our current realm, you know, multi-purpose lighter that we use to light the grill or light a candle, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to have 99 or you know, 100 grams of propane. So you're talking about very, very small amount of charge here and all these things is, is it's, it's such a small amount of liquid or refrigerant in the system that, it, you know, going from 150 up to 500 is, is a big change and it really is going to open up a lot of applications for this. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's a great representation. I'm glad you built that slide. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, oh. it's, it's, it's easy to, you know, it's hard to quantify what yeah. is a hundred grand. I can visualize right? that. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you visualize that? So, um, you know, it's, it, a lot of people are visual learners and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a good way to show it. No, so, thank you. Um, so Doug, we'll talk a little bit about system, some of the components in the systems, uh, that we see here and, and kind of what's, what's different about them. What's not. So, Sure. Uh, so a number of things will change. A number of things will stay the same. Uh, you know, what you'll notice with R290 systems, you know, they're going to be placard. That's R290. They're going to let yes. you know. Highly flammable. Highly Caution. flammable. So this is R290. So you'll have lots of warning mm -hmm. walking up to the system that it's something's different. That it Red is sleeves on all the process tubing in the service areas. And that's right. A lot exactly. of designations. Lots of designations, a lot of uh, advisements. So yeah. you'll see that. You know, you know, a lot of things I'll stay the same or are close to your, your evaporator, your piping, your filter dryers, uh, your capillary tubes. You know, none of that will will change. Um, I'm trying to see that slide. And then regards to uh, bear with me here. In regards to, uh, you know, ex ex TVs, expansion valves, if those systems are equipped with that, you might have a charge. The thermostatic element charge might be a little bit different. That's, you know, designed for. R290, but I mean, right. it's the same valve outside the, the power head. The still a metering device. Just yeah, different still pressure a metering on it. device. <laughs> still a metering device. So it, it, very, very minor differences. You know, the big thing is electrical components. Exactly. Uh, they got to be, uh, you know, enclosed and you can't, they can't be an ignition source. That's going to be, you know, anything electrical. There's where the big changes will be uh, with R290 or 600 for obvious reasons. Sure. In that regard. So. Uh, and just again, more on the components and compatibility. Obviously, the compressor must be designed and clearly labeled that it's for R290. Uh, the condenser, evaporators, meeting devices really are the same. Uh, in regards to you know uh, lubricants, really with R290 or 600, it could be either or polyester or mineral exactly. oil. Yep. Uh, it, it, either one works. Frankly, I, you know what I get, gather is a lot of the OEMs are still maintaining. 
polyester because it is a synthetic, sure. a very robust lubricant. We've got a lot of experience with it. Yes, yeah, so. a lot of stock of it as well. A lot of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so I think a lot of people, uh, OEMs are maintaining that, but it doesn't yeah, have do to be that sure. you know, from a technical perspective. Uh, again, the big thing here, the big takeaway is switches and say, you know, Door switches and everything else, they need to be rated for this duty. They have to be spark proof, you know, enclosed so they don't become ignition source. That is yeah. really the big takeaway. It uh, is. It's a key component, you know, for service key technicians. Component. If you replace anything electrical, doesn't matter if it is electrical and you touch it as a replacement part, it must have the same rated part going back in it. We can't just throw yeah. standard stock you know, uh, temperature controls that we had in our van, right? 1980 yep. any of that we can't use those. We have to use things that are specifically designed for our highly flammable applications. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the, you mm. know, we'll talk a little bit about the tools that a technician oh, yeah. will use. Um, really, and, and that's, that's the important thing. That's the thing that might be different is uh, technicians need to have tools that are designed for acceptable with or certified for flammable refrigerants, right? This is, uh, this is where some of that danger is present. You know, that's similar skills, similar tools, but they need to be designed specifically for hydrocarbons. So things like your uh, recovery machine, a gas monitor, a vacuum pump, you know, you really keeping in mind anything that could represent an ignition source, like we just talked about switches, anything like that, you know, safety is paramount. We want everyone to go home safe every day, you know, protect our, protect the, our customers, protect the company we work, you know, every, protect everybody in the food chain. So safety is paramount. And that's one of those things we always got to keep that top of mind. So we're using proper tools for the job we're doing. Um, and that's important to, uh, to remember, especially with something that is a flammable gas, like you mentioned, doesn't have the odorant in it that you do in your propane that you have on your barbecue no, grill. So, Really, you know, if someone's not familiar with what they're working on, what they're doing, there presents some safety concerns and, and just keeping that in mind. So and very important to read your manufacturer's installation and service instructions for every piece of equipment, because you're going to find with a lot of these highly flammable refrigerants, we're now into the exempt from recovery. Right. So we're doing a release of refrigerant versus recovery, but we are starting to see equipment slowly trickling into the industry that is rated for A3 recovery. Uh, there are some that are compressor powered and there are some that are really just vacuumed canisters for holding the refrigerant while you're doing repairs. So you want to make sure that you're following your manufacturer's um, specifications for those pieces of equipment and the areas that you are working on these in. Yeah, and that, that's exactly right. Is right. The hydrocarbons are an exempt gas. So the first thing we talk about is, is refrigerant recovery. Uh, you know, you are, so there is no such mandatory law that a technician must require the refrigerant when working on, on this. So, uh, you know, that presents a safety concern, right? So, uh, you know, if you are not going to recover the refrigerant, you need to keep in mind, you know, removing the unit to a safe area or outside of a flammable zone or you know, ensuring that you have more than adequate ventilation so that any release does not present a, uh, a fire hazard uh, and cause some sort of accident. So again, safety is this. This is one of the things we hit home in our wholesaler trainings. Is safety is almost the more, most important part of this whole thing. Is that these present a danger and, and we need to be safe. So exactly. If you are going to recover the refrigerant, you know, use a recovery machine designed for hydrocarbons. You know, normal normal recovery machines might have uh, should not uh, not be used uh, due to sources of ignition switches, pressure controls, right. relays. So if you're going to recover the refrigerant, you need to have a specific ma machine for that. As well, you need to have a specific recovery cylinder for a hydrocarbon uh, refrigerant as well. So you're not required to, but if you are going to do that, you need to make sure you have the tools. And even if you're not going to, make sure you're taking the proper steps to protect everybody. Yes, absolutely. So as well, then the, uh, the next thing would be the gas monitor, mm -hmm. um, you know, combustible, uh, a, a non odorized, uh, combustible gas or flammable gas, gas monitor should be the first thing turned on before entering the work area. And the last thing turned off when done working with flammable refrigerant. So, absolutely. you know, you can't smell it like, you know, people think propane, they think they can smell it. Right. That is not the case. So, Really, again, first thing turned on, last thing turned off. 
you know, making sure you're having that combustible gas meter, you know, and really using it when, you know, plugging in a, a unit in, unplugging it, servicing it, doing any sort of work on the system, it really should be on the whole time. So, you know, we uh, get that, those a- questions quite often. Is my traditional refrigerant leak detector acceptable for A3 refrigerants? And the answer is typically no, because most of them are a you know, heated anode, heated cathode, depending on the, the design of it, but they actually have current flowing through the through the tips, right? So we have to yep. be very careful to be using a combustible gas detector when we're working on our A3 systems or a leak detector that is absolutely designed for A3 highly flammable refrigerants. Yeah, yeah. That you hit, hit the nail on the head there, Clifton. So, and the last tool to c- keep in mind is a uh, vacuum pump. You know, normal vacuum pumps can be used outside the flammable zone. However, you know, again, just keeping things in mind, uh, it is best to have a specific pump when you're when you're looking at uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, that is a uh, is is the best practice. But if you had to, you could use it as long as it's outside the flammable zone. So, and, and we've seen um, a lot of our tool manufacturers really step in the game up in this arena here just in this last year as well. So we are starting to see uh, a traditional equipment that is being recertified and reconstructed for your A3 purposes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just important to make sure you're, you know, you're aware of what you're working on and aware of what your tools are capable of. And that's, that's just, you know, taking exactly. care of everybody in the food chain. So, exactly. Um, Good yeah. stuff. Yeah. So that this gets us a little bit into, um, into what we have and what new Calgon offers to help the technician and the end users and, and people who are working uh, and encountering this actually on a servicing level or, or owning yeah. equipment that might have this. So uh, we developed, uh, Doug developed the EcoPure line a couple of years ago. Like I said, a wholesaler was in our building, said they were having people ask for this, had issues getting it. Uh, so we developed this through our, our vendor partnerships. Uh, you've got uh, R290, which again is your refrigerant grade propane, or R600A, which is your isobutane. Um, something we're, we're, we really think is important is that all of our gases that we provide meet the AHRI 700, 700. standard mm-hmm. uh, for 99.5% purity. Every batch that's produced has a certificate of analysis that certifies that nice. purity. You know, purity is important as Absolutely. purity goes down efficiency or energy efficiency is going to go down. You're going to consume more energy, you know, that you're kind of going to nullify some of the benefits of having a, a, a good gas or refrigerant in there. So, um, you know, eco, we're really proud of this purity standard and we, we believe it's something the industry should, uh, should, should be mindful of. And if you look at many of the manufacturers, they specifically state something that is, is pure, you know, on the, uh, in their manufacturers, uh, guideline right. for service so, requirements. Yep, exactly. So, and again, we talked about it before, but non-odorized. The, the odorant would affect the purity. Mm-hmm. So it's a contaminant. Why, yep, it's a contaminant. So um, your R290, your R600A, meeting that 99.5% purity uh, standard. Uh, as well, we've got, um, you know, what? why did we pick EcoPure as the name? It's uh, EcoPure, Eco for refrigerant, environmentally friendly, pure for the highly pure. Uh, some of the... Uh, some of the products on the market say the refrigerant grade propane, but don't ever put the uh, purity standard uh, on the can or anything like we do. So uh, as well, we've got two tools for the uh, technicians. We've got a charging system, which is that case in the middle there, which is a, a integrated scale uh, for someone who might not have a gram weight scale already. Exactly. Uh, and then we've it's got a big the, deal. Uh, yep. Yep. And that's the thing is, is that when you're talking about, it's kind of skipped over this earlier, but when you've got a, 150 gram charge, (laughs) you have to critically weigh it to the gram, right? Think about how critical that is, right? Look at that lighter and go, all right, uh, this is how much we're using. How much can I be off? Uh, None. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. How much do I lose in my hoses? (laughs) Let's minimize it as much as possible. Yep. Yeah. So if you've got a... (laughs) You overcharge a system that's got 10 pounds in it. If you overcharge it a couple ounces, you might not notice the performance. But if you yeah. overcharge a, uh, a system with 150 grams <laughs> by by you know a few ounces, you're you're certainly going to notice that. Very so um, the the system, which is the integrated scale, is good for a technician that doesn't have a gram scale. Um, many technicians do already. So 
Uh, that's why I've got the assembly, which is kind of a tool to allow them to use their existing scale. Yeah, it's a really um, nice without assembly. having to need to buy that. So um, we'll kind of go through each of those here. Um, but uh, the the first product that R six or R two ninety again refrigerant grade propane meets the seven hundred standard, non odorized. Uh, so our can is is ten point six ounces. Okay. Uh, which is 300 grams, which is nice because that means it can it can fully charge to two charge. of the largest systems available yeah. on the market. Currently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and many many systems are smaller than that, so you can get multiple charges out of this. You know, you don't have to. It's not a one shot deal. Um, ours is a reusable canister. So if you if you take off the top of our can and look at the valve. It's actually got a poppet style valve on top there. I so gotcha. yeah. what yeah, happens is when you hook that up to your scale or your assembly, uh, there's a, a it will depress the valve and allow the refrigerant to escape. As soon as you remove it, it's going to seal the can again so you can use it on the next job. Excellent. Uh, yeah, exactly. Some of the some of the options on the market are piercing style cans. So they require yeah, actually yeah. the physical use of a piercing valve that stays on the can to stay on the can. The, the challenge with that is it's, you can't really safely seal it once you're done um, as well. Then, you, you know, if you have a charge, 300 gram charge in the can, you know, you have to figure out what to do with the rest of that charge once you're finished on that job. So, and I'm assuming no dip tube within the can. So when we're removing our fitting, we pr should probably be in the upright position yep. so as not to release liquid to utilize vapor to seal it off. Correct. Yeah. There's, so there's no, there is not a dip tube. So, and, and we talk about that a little bit with the charging assembly. I, if we've got time, I'll, I'll connect it up, yeah. but you always point the can up when you're connecting. Cause there, if you point it down and you connect, you're going to get liquid coming out of the can, which is, is obviously a safety hazard. Sure. So, absolutely. Uh, and okay. messy. So uh, yeah, this is, this is, is, is safely reseal the top of the, the can um, once you're done using it as well, no dip too, but it is reusable on many jobs. So that we're, Perfect. you know, keeping safety in mind as well as keeping, uh, customers able to use, you know, technician able to easily use something on many, many calls. Yeah. yeah Cause we know um, if we have a valve attached to the top of a can thrown on a shelf in the back of a van, we all know what happens with vibrations in a van. Yep. everything loosens up right? yep. <laughs> so yeah. this eliminates that potential for leaks of having yep. a mechanical absolutely. fitting on a refrigerant cylinder absolutely yeah that's that's exactly the design you know again you know leaving it on there is, is not a great option so we we wanted something that's safer for everybody involved and, and allows you to to use something more than once yeah that's a so. great feature i like that yep absolutely um you know where where r290 is the much more common of these two r 600 a is is significantly less that we see out there, but you know, you're going to see this in medium and low temp refrigeration. Like we talked about those pop coolers at uh, yeah. Walgreens or a Kroger, um, little freezer chest, clear ice machines, those sorts of things. Uh, I'm waiting for here. those first ice machine phone calls. I, I used to love technical support, <laughs> right? And that was like, as, as a technical trainer, that was one of my favorite things to do technical support because it's a one-on-one -on -one personal educational opportunity. Uh, yeah. I can only imagine that first call from a Manitowoc or refrigeration technician going, hey, uh, this doesn't have 404 in this thing. What do I do now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, <laughs> so the other option is 600A, which is going to mm -hmm. be uh, similar. It had all the same features. It's got uh, that's just refrigerant grade isobutane. Again, meeting that our uh, AHRI 700 standard, 99. not also non odorized, mm -hmm. also a 300 gram canister, also reusable. Um, you know that that one thing we talked about, we didn't talk about on the previous slide, is that reusable. Um, you know, if you've got that piercing valve style valve on top. To, to invert it and on a scale and get a true liquid charge to get your gram charge yeah. is cumbersome, right? You have sure. to kind of rig it up. You have to or, find or something to brace it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's another problem. It, uh, other than the safety concern of using a piercing style valve, actually getting the, the critical charge right and properly uh, with on your scale is, is a little bit cumbersome. Now there's some other tools out there, but um, you know, this is, it, it, it's challenging when you don't have that that resealable design on the can. So mm -hmm. I can see that. Um, 
You see this a little bit less uh, frequently, like I said, medium temp refrigeration. Um, this is more your household leaning appliances, um, and it is a is a significantly lower uh, mover. Um, 290 is, is much more of the mainstay at, at this point. So, um, so yeah, the, uh, the next thing we've got is our charging, uh, assembly. So there that's, that go. is a, this is a great option. If anybody has a gram weight scale, I love this um, setup already. This is an awesome option for a technician. Mm -hmm. Um, this is going to give you that allow you to use your current scale to get precision gram weight. Um, what it is, is it's a um, weighted platform. It comes in an easy, easy to open clamshell. Um, and what it's got is it's got this nice weighted block, uh, which you connect your refrigerant there. That's your cylinder too. Yeah. Just con connect your cylinder to. It's got the uh, depressor there. It'll, they'll open that valve up. And it's got an integrated hose with a ball valve uh, on the end of it. It's got... Uh, a very short hose, and it's a small diameter. Again, we sure. don't want to lose We don't want to lose refrigerant. Yeah. Exactly. We're not trying to lose refrigerant as we get it into the system. So it's a small bore hose. It's a very short, uh, short hose. But this is a great option for an experienced technician uh, that they can uh, use a tool or use tool, a scale they already have in their truck. This allows them to now work on hydrocarbon refrigerant and charge those really small systems without having to use, uh, you know, discard that current scale that they have. And that's exactly so, right. Great add-on um, component. Yeah, this is a this is a great accessory. It's at, it's pretty affordable um, option for a technician to have, but this is a really great tool um, out there uh, for for technicians. So nice. Um, the next option we've got is the charging system, and this is a great choice. Uh, for, uh, I got this one over here. Okay. Um, this is a, the charging system is uh, a great option for someone who might not have a gram weight scale or who might not, uh, you know, might not have that already. So uh, this is an integrated scale um, and hose and every, it's all, it's all in one package. So uh, you've got the carrying case shown in the picture there. You can use it with R290 or R600A. Uh, it has a precision gram weight accuracy. Um, if you go further and you actually open up the case, it's got that hard carrying case. Uh, you can actually store your refrigerant in the case. So everything's oh, in one kit. There you go. Uh, really nice option there. That's my little service kit right there. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. You're going in, you can just grab that one box out of the, you know, that one box with your tool bag out of the truck. Yeah. Um, I like that. The canister is not sold in there. That would change the DOT specs on the, on the package. Oh, yeah, yeah. How it's yep, shipped. True. Right. But so they are sold separately, but. B-Y-O-R. Bring your own refrigerant. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to use. We're gonna have to use that. Uh, That's a good one. <laughs> you steal that one for our trainings. Um, but it's a really great option. So it's again, it's got a similar connection piece on the top. It's going to depress that cylinder valve. Uh, it's got an integrated hose right in the side there, uh, and then it's got that again, that small diameter short hose with the ball valve at the end. Minimal. Again, you don't want to lose lost. any sort of refrigerant. Uh, during the charging process or when you're connecting things or, or disconnecting, um, you want to lose as little refrigerant as possible because, again, you're working with very small charges here, something that could be dangerous. So, um, you know, this is a really nice tool for technicians who might not have that scale already. So super, um, cool, super cool setup. Yeah, super. Very, very cool setup. Um, so, you know, some additional charging tips. These are things that are important to keep in mind. Uh, you know, follow OEM guidelines, instructions, right? Consult their service manuals before work. You know, that is, uh, you know, that's very, very important, right? If you're not familiar with the equipment, you know, a couple minutes of research are not a terrible idea, right? So right. keep everyone safe. I have this amazing uh, you know, we thing get... called the internet out here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure you're using reliable, trusted sources. Yep. That's all yep. That we ask. Uh, you know, the OEM, OEMs are do a great job, really. I mean, exactly the, right. one thing that's awesome about the internet is you can find manuals almost anywhere online. You know, you can type in a model number and you can find the manual for that piece of equipment. And it's, it's great to consult that as you're working uh, on those. So, um, and we hit on this, this, earlier, but it's really, you know, it 
could not be more important to weigh in the charge precisely. You know, gram gram weight measurement is is a paramount thing, and it is it should be you know really the most important part of this thing. Is, is, other than safety, is, is properly weighing the charge in. Um, you know, over or undercharging will greatly impact performance. So uh, that, that's super important. And then you know, again, we also talked about keeping the canister upright. You want that canister pointed up when you're char- connecting that charging. Uh, assembly or the system uh, to the, the to the canister, keep it pointed up. Otherwise, you're going to get a liquid leak. Mm-hmm. So, uh, really important. Um, you know, just follow all the guidelines. You know, all the guidelines from the manufacturers uh, as far as the OEMs and parts to use, how to charge the system. Those things are are just absolutely very paramount to uh, to to do. So, um, you know, that's. Uh, the other thing that last safety tips we talk yeah. about are, um, you know, these these don't require an EPA certification, but it's it certainly is is encouraged that any technician working on this and we get this request periodically is, is training. You know, techs who are working on these systems should go through some sort of training first. Um, and, you know, keep in mind, uh, monitor, ventilate and eliminate. So, uh, you know. Turn on that gas monitor before entering the work area. On your area. way in, yeah. Yep. Don't turn it off until you leave. Okay. Is there proper ventilation in the system? You know, how are how are you ventilating? You know, do you have enough ventilation or adequate ventilation in the area? And then eliminate. You know, you you have to turn off or eliminate all ignition sources. Some of these are in, um, you know, commercial kitchens. Yeah, you know, confined spaces. Yeah, confined spaces. There's lots of ignition opportunities in, uh, in a commercial kitchen. So. Uh, you know, really keeping, you know, those three things in mind, monitor, eliminate um, and ventilate, uh, just keeping that in mind as you work is is very important, um, really. And then you just the, the canister storage, even just storing that, you know, don't keep it connected to the device. Keep it, you know, out of direct sunlight. Don't, you know, leave it in a parked vehicle where it's going to exceed 120 degrees. You know, there's again, it, we kind of hit, hit the nail already enough, but it's uh, safety is important with this. You protect everybody and who's working on these things. So, um, Definitely. you know, canister storage plays a part in that. So, um, and then really the, the last part is there's resources out there. If you look at, um, if you look at true manufacturing or Lear, you go to their websites or YouTube channels, they've got tutorials on those sources specifically to, on those pieces of equipment. Exactly. If you true yeah. manufacturing, they, they've got a, a specific, you know, charging and recovery. They've got some a good training module on their YouTube channel. Um, you know, and Bracco Copeland have some training information available. Um, so there's lots of the OEMs are really doing their part to support the industry. Uh, but there's also some other trade groups out there. Uh, North American Sustainable Refrigerant Council has some, right. some training summits coming up. Yes, you know, they sure do. Three of those coming up um, in November and then uh, next year. So. Uh, there's the industry as a whole is really doing a lot to actually um, to to support and educate people because this is going to become such a big thing for the industry. Um, and there are so many safety concerns and it is such a, a, a change from what we've got before. It, it's a really uh, we're all doing it, trying to do our part to support. Uh, it's really what it comes down to. You know, th- yeah. this is a community. This is a bunch of industry professionals that come hang out once a week and go, there's a lot of things to talk about. There's a lot of change. There's a lot of transition. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of things to overcome. But if we provide ourselves with the proper resources and we make sure that we have the connections to the correct education, it's like everything in life. We overcome because we educate. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the New Calgon University, things that you offer there as well. Because yeah, this is a, a piece of New Calgon, but there's a lot of things that you offer for training for professionals within our industries. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I can't remember how many um, classes are on there now, but there are classes on on just about everything we offer, whether it's uh, coil cleaners or indoor air quality or uh, water filtration. It, 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 you know, flush and total system protection. It, it, there's a host of classes. It, I can't remember the exact number, but it, yeah. there's just, I seen a, a lot wealth. when I was skimming through it. There's, <laughs> there's some really good stuff in there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a wealth of information on there to educate, um, 
consumers, uh, wholesalers, sales guys, technicians, it's a great opportunity to get kind of a, a, a basic understanding of, of what we offer in, in all those different categories. Um, you know, and that's, that's a really great tool. You can do it online, do it on your phone. It, it's a great option for, um, for, for the industry to use. Um, I know when I started at the company, you know, I'm, I'm fairly new to New Calgon, but uh, I went through them all and it's just a great crash course in, in everything that's out there. So excellent. Um, yeah. Now we still have quite a few people out there. Anyone have any questions that they would like to ask while we're here or do you need connection points to get more resources for New Calgon? You need to find your local reps because we have New Calgon with us. So if you have questions <laughs> about New Calgon, let's take the opportunity to uh, to learn a little bit more. And uh, are you guys going to be at the National HVACR Education Conference in March? Uh, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I said, I don't the believe I will be there. I know one of our, our, our national trainer from uh, Alabama. I know Ben uh, Pasquinelli has usually gone yeah. in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I imagine you'll be there. I would be, I'm speculating here, but I would imagine he'll be there again. Uh, you know, he does a, he, he enjoy, he's big into education and working with, uh, the, the trade schools and, and things in the industry. Yep. Yeah. The industry. So I, I would imagine Ben will be there representing us. Fantastic. So, so for anyone interested in that, make sure to grab a picture of that. Go see us at escogroup.org. Select the, um, see that one is a, it doesn't go directly to the conference. You go to HVACR and then you go to the conference. Um, but that QR will take you directly to it. But definitely go to escogroup.org and learn a lot more about the things that we have going on here at ESCO and with the conference. And yeah, you're right, BB. Um, we really appreciate <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is what we're here for. A lot of people go, new Calgon and propane and isobutane. What the heck are you talking about? And we go, uh, we're talking about an industry leader that is here to educate and entertain, right? I mean, and yeah. so that's is what we do. We, we come together and we have fun talking about change as we yeah. should. These are difficult topics. It's difficult to look at a topic and go, this is nothing like what you're used to working with and you're going yeah. to encounter it. And if you're not prepared, it's going to catch you with your shorts down and you're going to go, wait a minute. I can't use my gauges. I can't use my scales. I can't use my torch unless the refrigerant's out of this thing. And, uh, I got to buy little cans and little hoses and little scales. And <laughs> why wasn't I prepared for this? And we go, well, it's simply because you weren't on the, did you know show? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, let's make sure that we plan some follow-up conversations. I would love to do some deep dives into proper chemical selections. Because remember, we've got a technology transition we're going through as well. We're going to see more microchannel stuff. Yeah. We're going to see a lot more aluminum. We're going to see a variety of compounds. I just had someone send me a bunch of information on uh, steel line sets for residential applications. And I went, all right, I guess I better dive a little bit deeper into these. <laughs> so there's a lot of things for us to talk about. And uh, man, we're, we're grateful that you guys joined us today. This is a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, we're, we're happy to be here. And, you know, we're, we're happy to help any of our customers anytime. And these, these trainings are, and this education is such a big part of who we are and, and what yeah. we do. And, and we're just, we're happy to do our part. And, and you know, it's, it's great to have the opportunity. Excellent. All right. I think we're winding down. So we've got people out there in the audience. We appreciate everyone hanging in there with us and uh, we look forward to seeing you. And if you have topics that you want covered, just let me know. See back at escogroup.org and we'll make sure that we get the right people here for you. So uh, yeah, Dave, Doug, thank you guys so much. All right. We'll see Thanks, everyone. Austin. Thank you. We'll see you all next week on Did You Know the Esco Age Fact Show. Hey, and come back and watch these on YouTube and on the website. Tell everyone about these. This is <laughs> it's education for you. See you all. Great. Take care.